Hi, good afternoon and welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch and also there was a coffee available, so hope you were able to grab some uh, because we have an equally delightful afternoon planned for you this afternoon. And we start with the third panel, which is on economics of innovation, licensing and IPR in, in India, past trends and future roadmap. So to begin, uh, I'd like to invite our first panelist on this, who is Professor Rahul Tena Telang, who is from Information Systems at Carnegie Mellon. He's a co-director of Center Initiative for Digital Entertainment Analytics and has worked extensively with industry and policymakers on variety of issues surrounding digitization of media. His other key research interest is in understanding the incentives of various parties uh, why markets fail, how to create a useful policy framework, and how to measure the effectiveness of such policies. Um, he's co-author of a very interesting book called Streaming, Sharing, Stealing, uh, Big Data and Future of Entertainment. Please help me welcome Professor Rahul Telang. Next up is Mr. Vivek Kamat, Managing Director, Merck Sharp and Dhome Pharmaceuticals, India. Vivek has over 25 years of experience in marketing, sales, and general management. He's also the Asian and South Asia with healthcare organizations such as Fulford, Warner Lambert, P. Pfizer, Ranbaxy, Novartis, and Roche. He has successfully built mega brands via marketing and sales excellence, and also led integration and cultural change during mergers, while managing bus maintaining business performance. Welcome, Vivek. Next, I'd like to welcome Rajat Kathuria, who is Director and Chief Executive at Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, New Delhi. He has over 20 years of experience in teaching and 15 years experience in economic policy. Uh, and besides research, in, uh, besides research interest on a range of issues relating to regulation and competition policy. He has worked with the World Bank, Washington DC as a consultant, and carried out research assignments for a number of international organizations, including ILO, U UNCTAD, Lirin Asia, World Bank, and ADB. He's uh, published extensively in international and national journals, and is also an author in popular magazines and newspapers. Welcome, Rajat. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Dave Robinson, a partner at Shardul Amarchand Mang Mangaldas. Dave Robinson leads the firm's intellectual property practice with patent prosecution remaining as his mainstay. He represents international and domestic clients in a host of IP matters, including trademarks, trade dress, goodwill copyrights, designs, internet, and technology. Dave has represented Honeywell, Texas Instruments, Motorola, Sony, and Ericsson in inventions relating to electronics, telecommunications, and computation. He's also Asia IP identifies him as one of the 550 key patent experts. Welcome, Dave. <laughs> Last but not the least, I would like to invite a faculty moderator, Professor Anand Nand Kumar. Anand is Associate Professor of Strategy at ISB and the Academic Director for our Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He explores industry and firm level phenomena that influence inno innovation, the generation of new ideas and entrepreneurship, distribution and commercialization of news, new ideas. Professor Nan Anand Nand Kumar currently works in the innovation stream, examines the effect of strong IPR on different aspects of innovation, such as influence of stronger patents, on long-run incentives for innovation or the influence of stronger patents on the functioning of markets for technology. Welcome, Anand, and over to you. I hope you, uh, you all had a good lunch, and I'm convinced that the insights from this session would digest it just as fast uh, before the coffee break. So welcome to the panel on economics of innovation, licensing, and IPR in India, past trends and future roadmap. Um, I just want to make a few opening comments before I hand it over to the uh, respective speakers. Uh, some broad thoughts on uh, the role of IPR, broadly defined, and maybe its influence on uh, different aspects of innovation and commercialization. 
we spoke a lot, we have spoken a lot, uh, both yesterday as well as today, about access to products uh, as well as ideas. One argument about uh, stronger IPR is that maybe it facilitates licensing. We had a rich uh, discussion yesterday afternoon as well. And maybe licensing increases access to products and services as well, maybe through some of it through the domestic firms uh, in India as well. And maybe the spillovers that emanate from this kind of activity might seed the future generation of ideas, especially by the local uh, Indian firms, domestic firms. And we've all been uh, at some level either priding about the fact that India is good in certain types of innovations or lamenting about the fact that there's, there hasn't been enough. Either way, maybe the spillovers is going to increase the number of ideas that are generated, especially by these domestic firms, is quite possible. Um, stronger IPRs might also increase uh, technology transfer. Uh, and once again, if you put it in the context of the spillovers that might emanate from this technology transfer, the effects could really be uh, quite substantial in terms of encouraging domestic innovation. Um, and you know, like one of the speakers said, Indian brands, global Indian brands as well. But you know, if you read through the literature, it's unclear about whether uh, we need licensing, I mean, we need IPR for licensing itself. Uh, there was an interesting case uh, that somebody spoke about uh, yesterday as well, where a case wherein licensing in the pharmaceutical industry, wherein patents are typically thought to be very strong, uh, can actually happen even without stronger IPRs. Um, in fact, uh, there have been other uh, instances as well, like, uh, like my uh, uh, esteemed advisor, Ashish Arora, has pointed out, sometimes licensing could also happen without IPRs, especially when you can bundle it with know-how, for example. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, maybe there is uh, a, a weaker IPRs on the other hand uh, might involve uh, copying and creating new product development in the, and this might see the generation of ideas in a very, very different way. So we have these sort of two different trade-offs and of course there are these differences between industries as well in the influence or the link between IPR and licensing and generation of new ideas versus, on the other hand, not having IPRs, encouraging imitation, and maybe generating ideas that way. So we have this interesting trade-off. We have an interesting panel of, panel of speakers spanning at least the uh, healthcare industry as well as the uh, digital uh, industry. And we have a, somebody who can, who's going to add an academic perspective as well as a legal perspective on issues. So without further delay, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Telang to start off and talk about piracy and new product creation, a Bollywood story. Yeah. 15 minutes. I'm a professor. Once I start, I don't stop. So I just wanted to make sure how long I have. I didn't as well, So, but I, I hope you don't follow my example. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, the organizers, Charantan, for inviting me. It's, uh, I have been, it's, it's been an exciting day, and I'm learning a lot from all of you. Um, my name is Rahul Tilang, and I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon. And you know, one of the one of the area of research for me for the last ten years is just looking at how technologies actually affect industries, societies, and policy making. And one of the one of the one of the industry that I have been very interested in is the entertainment industry, which broadly is music, movies, and book publishing. And especially in the U.S. and I'm sure uh, in India as well. There has been a large impact on, in this industry due to the technology, the growth of mobile and the internet and broadband, which led to a lot of copyright infringement. And if you look at the industry over the last 15 years, where you know, the US has six large studios, which has essentially dominated the industry for the last 100 years. And today, the firms like Netflix and Amazon and Google are probably one of the most dominant studios, if I can use the word, where they are spending more money in content creation. And these companies, their DNA is engineering. Their DNA is data. They're making a lot of data-driven decisions. And, and it's very exciting, uh, the kind of content that is going to be produced, the, the kind of content we are going to consume, and how the technology is just uh, disrupting this industry in ways that we never thought it would. So, 
So within this context, uh, I'm going to talk about one particular project that I have been working on. My broader interest is just looking at um, you know, how technology is reshaping, but in particular, um, you know, I'm looking at the copyright space and how the copyright policies actually affect some of the different outcomes. So um, basically, if you look at any IPR or any copyright regime, we are broadly just interested in understanding how the copyright or IP policy affects firm profitability, how it affects the user's uh, consumption, like how it affects you and I, and, and more importantly, which is what I'm going to spend a little bit of time today, is trying to think about how it affects innovation and creativity. So broadly, we would like to believe that our policy making is done in a way that it encourages uh, innovation and, and production and creativity. Um, and, and broadly, this question has been of great interest, especially uh, in some of the Western countries, is because the, the digitization of content, as soon as the music became ones and zeros and the movies became the, the binary bits of ones and zeros, it became very easy to start transmitting them and it became very hard to protect them. So you can't really have large control over the content that you're creating and some of that content takes a lot of money to create. So it's a high fixed investment um, uh, industry and, and you lose some of the control uh, and, and that has led to a lot of this discussion about that how should we recalibrate our policy? How should we look at our copyright when the technology has disrupted in ways that we never thought it was possible? Uh, it leads to this, all sort of questions about what sort of enforcement makes sense. How do you even stop infringement? How do you reduce infringement? Who should reduce infringement? Is it the policymaker's responsibility? It is the government's responsibility? Is it need to be done by the firm? So there are a variety of questions. We don't know many of these things. We don't know how effective some of those strategies are. Um, and my group spends a lot of time thinking about many of these questions in a very data-driven way. Um, so, so broadly, we know that when, when it's easy for people to copy and infringe your content, um, we, we like to believe that the producers will lose money. So now you can't make money because people are just stealing your content. Or, and the consumers will at least benefit in the short run. After all, I'm able to get access to that content for free or at a very cheap uh, cost. And it, it leads to more widespread, so more people can consume the content because now essentially it's free. You can think about the demand curve at zero price. The demand is essentially as much as it could be. Um, so so there, is a, there is this concept that the producers can't make uh, enough money. Uh, but, but we also like to believe, or at least we think, um, that, that at least in the long run, when the producers can't make money, they will also making less product they will also be making less investments, um, the creative output will decline, and that will eventually hurt the consumer. So yes, in the short run, we can copy and you know, we can share, uh, but in the long run, there will be just less investment going around, and, and that will affect us uh, as a society in, in, in ways that, that, is, that is very adverse. Um, and some of these things are a little bit, um, part of the larger research agenda we, I have, but I'm not going to talk. I'm just, what I'm just pointing out is, even though these things look like somewhat of an obvious fact, actually finding empirical evidence is extremely difficult. In fact, finding the evidence that, um, that the large scale infringement affect profitability of firm itself has been very controversial. Actually, a lot of people believe that, well, it is just the technology shock that has been happening, or that the firms simply are not providing content to the user at the right price point, and so on and so forth. So this itself is an interesting academic question that people have been looking at, because this is not a very uh, easy question to answer, even though we might like to believe that this might be happening, or even though the producers might like to believe. Um, so there has been a lot of literature, um, and people have been you know, writing a um, you know, bunch of things. A much more interesting or much more complex issue is that sometimes, even if you believe infringement hurts, it's not actually obvious who is responsible. You know, this value chain is actually a lot more complicated, right? So here are all these different players who are sitting in the value chain. They all play some role in our ability to consume the content. So website, they're hosting the content. You know, are they responsible? Should we block them? how effective it is to block them. I know there are some of these efforts going on in, the Indi in India as well, but this has been going on in, in, in worldwide, and again, tends to be challenging um, and, and controversial sometimes. 
going after end users, they are the one who are infringing. Is that profitable strategy? Usually leads to bad press for the firm and, and you know, the, the associated downside with it. Uh, how about the internet service provider? After all, they are the one who are providing the pipes, so should they be held responsible for some of the infringement that's going on? People have argued about the role of the search engines. So, you know, I and you and I, well, you don't do it, but I can sometimes infringe because I can go on Google and type and Google shows me all these places where I'm, I can infringe from. Um, and, and media industry would like to believe that maybe Google has a role to play in, in, in making it difficult for users to find the content. So uh, merchants who accept the credit cards, or who, who are able to get the uh, advertising on their web pages. So there are a lot of subtle points here that people have mentioned, in particular because the content creator says that, you know, I can't really control my content. It is the people sitting in the middle that who sometimes control the content. And, um, as I said, this makes the legal part of this extremely difficult and very challenging, and, and maybe as an academic, very interesting. Here, I'm just giving you some example of some of the work we have done about how effective the website blockings can be. Um, and and uh, you know, they tend to be effective in the short run. The long-term viability of some of these strategies is, I think, questionable at best. So, so what I want to spend maybe the next eight minutes is actually looking at some evidence from India. The second part of the question, which is, does the copyright policies have an effect on the production of the content? That is, do the copyright policies incentivize the creation of the product and vice versa, which is when the copyrights become loose and, and infringement become widespread, does it actually lead to uh, you know, some production, um, takes a hit on the production side and creative side and so on and so forth, right? And again, one of those things where we would like to believe that a, a good copyright policy actually encourages innovation, investments, and, 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 and generation of crea uh, you know, creative output. Uh, but, but the empirical evidence here is actually very tricky. So one argument is that the, the people who are in the creative industry, they are not necessarily motivated by money alone. So if I can, even if you make less money, maybe because people are able to share, Okay, you know, Julia Roberts, she charges $20 million, but she'll work for $10 million as well. So that $10 million is just the rent seeking, and if it gets transferred to the end user, there's really no big deal about it. So there's one argument that the creative output is probably not very elastic, as you would say, to some of these infringement that has been going on. It's like, a, you know, the example is like this, you know, Loch Ness Monster, where uh, everybody has heard about it, but nobody has sort of seen it. So that's kind of the evidence you see typically in the, in, in the, the creative output side. We believe that the, uh, our policies have a large effect, but it's very, very actually hard to see in the data that whether it happens or not. Uh, one of the reasons that has been also going on is because the, 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 the lot of infringement in the last 10, 15 years has been associated with a significant cost reduction. So it's much easier to now create content, so it kind of makes it really, really hard to kind of distangle the effect of whether it's the cost reduction or whether it's infringement or our copyright policies. And, and so the question basically we are interested in is how elastic producers are to the revenue. And as I said, I'll actually provide you evidence a lot of people have shown that it's actually the other way around. So here is an example. My co-author, uh, Val Fogel, who does you know, uh, pretty influential work in this space, he actually looked at the number of music that is created um, and, and he basically showed that, or at least argued that, there is very little evidence to see in the data that widespread copying of music, especially since growth of Napster, actually made a difference in the amount of music that is created. And he looked at various statistics, not just the amount of music created, but also the quality of music and popularity of music and all those sort of things, and it makes a pretty convincing argument that what are we complaining about? If you look at the creative output, it hasn't been affected one bit uh, due, to, due to all these complaints by, by the music label. So this is the kind of, uh, I'm just trying to highlight that it's very hard sometimes to see the impact of copyright policies into the creative output. Okay, so that led me to actually think about um, some markets where we can see this effect, or at least hope to see this effect a little bit more convincingly. Um, so Joel and I actually worked on a project together, which I'll just highlight. So 
the one of the market we thought would be interesting to look at is the motion picture industry because motion picture industry the creation is high fixed cost it, it is just costly to make a movie relative to creating a music album um, so it just is you would think that that industry would be a lot more responsive or a lot more elastic to how uh, you know the, the weakness in our copyright or or the or the more infringement might have a larger effect to to be seen so um, so what we did was we actually did a little bit of a thought experiment and a case study and and uh, I'll show you some numbers so what we look we focused on is um, the growth of the VCR market. So VCR, the, the, the video recording, and you, some of us are uh, familiar with it more than others, um, was basically a technology that came in early 80s. And essentially, it got introduced pretty much the world over. Um, before VCR, it was really hard for us, for anybody to kind of copy the movie. You couldn't really copy and share. And then here came the VCR, where you can basically copy and then have the pirated copy play on your video cassette rec recorder and basically watch a movie anywhere you want. And in fact, when the VCR came, the motion picture industry in America bitterly complained. They went to the Congress and we said, we should ban this device because it's going to destroy the motion picture industry. In fact, eventually, the motion picture industry in the USA realized that the VCR is a money spinner. And they probably make a whole lot more money because of the VCR than they ever made by just doing the theatrical part. But that's a separate question. All I'm going to argue is that the VCR actually did have a very large negative effect in the developing countries, especially like India. Because we had, at least I believe, uh, had a poor intellectual pro property protection. So we couldn't protect the content. And that simply meant that the VCR actually had a very large negative outcome. And one other thing that I was interested in is to just look at the, the creation side rather than the box office side. So I'll just show you. I won't go into too many details on the, you know, how the regressions are run. It's, I'll just show you some pictures, and hopefully that's, uh, that's, that will be convincing enough. OK. So here are um, uh, just a number on the box office revenue of the movies. By the way, collecting box office revenue data is very hard, uh, especially in India. So a lot of it is. Um, you can go in the paper to realize. So it took me a little while to figure all of this out. But anyway, I'm just plotting. Forget about the, the, the red line. Just look at the, the, the dots, which basically very clearly show that actually till 80s, the industry was growing. The movies were making a, you know, more money. So there was just positive growth till, till 80s. And then the box office performance of the movie essentially plunged till 2000. So there was a large negative shock on how much of money is where the Bollywood movies were making on the box office from mid 80s all the way till 2000. And then there was an increase. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then I said, what happened to the production? So OK, you're making less money. But what happened to the production? And then these are some different indexes I'm showing. One is from IMDb. One is from the censor board. One is from the regional, all of that. And you can look at. From mid 80s onward, there was a sharp reduction in the number of movies that were produced as well. So it's sort of like the producers is looking at the market and say, I can't make enough money. And if you can't make enough money, they say, I don't want to make a movie now. Because I, it's not profitable enough for me to essentially make a movie. So you can see that the correlation in the data is pretty obvious that there was a significant contraction in the output as a function of Various things, the VCR was one of the dominant ones. In case you think that this may be driven by some other things, I'll show you none of that was happening in the economy. Our population was increasing, the GDP was going, the per capita, everything was growing during that period, except that the movie number of movies created actually fell down uh, you know, significantly around the time. So it provides some evidence that you, know, you have a technology and you don't protect the intellectual property you know, the, the producers actually are responding to it by, in, in this example, kind of contracting the product. And this didn't happen anywhere else. If you look at, so the VCR entered in many, in fact, it, it entered world over. And I'm giving you examples from other countries, whether it's France and UK and US, where the entry of VCR had no effect on the production, except in India. There are other countries as, as well, like Hong Kong and Singapore, which had the similar negative shock on how the technology essentially disrupted. I'll, I'll end, uh, I'll take one more minute. Uh, however, um, 
over the last 10 years, essentially 2005 onwards, what happened in India was that the theaters started getting digitized. So all the single screen theaters where we used to have analog prints that used to go from one theater to the other, which was very expensive, very inefficient. What has been happening over the last 10 years is that the theaters are getting digitized. And what that actually means is, now the movies can release at the same time everywhere all across India, as opposed to 10, 15 years ago where you know, the movie will go in Mumbai first, and then it'll go to Indore, and then it'll go to some. And, and the VCRs essentially skimmed off all the money. So by the time the movie went to Indore, People had already watched it on a copied VCR and those video parlors, and you know the producer basically lost a significant amount of money. So, um, so, so, so here is an example of the number of screens, and you can see that 2005 onwards, the number of screens where the movie can release simultaneously has just exploded. Uh, what that means that if you actually look at the investment in the movies, so this, the, these two curves simply show the revenues that the movies are making. It literally coincides with the digitization of theaters. So 2005 onwards, the box office revenues of the movie has also exploded, where now you can release the movie all over the country at the same time, just means that you can monetize it much more efficiently than you could do otherwise. But more interestingly for us is that not only the box office revenues have gone up, the investment, that the budgets of the movies have also gone up. So the, the movie producers are not just sitting on that money and saying, I can make the money and just pocket the rent. They are investing some of that money back into the movies. Now, we might all disagree that the movies are still crappy, but the budgets of the movies have definitely been plowed, so the production quality and what have you. All right, so that's my um, signal to stop. So, um, you know, this is something that I've been very interested in, trying to understand what those, what those policies actually mean and trying to see and tie it up in the data. Um, and, and I think uh, you know, the, 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 the more interesting part is that you see no such evidence in Hollywood. Uh, you know, if you try to look at uh, you know, how Hollywood has been responding, and one of the arguments is that it is the country like India where the, the industry still has a long way to go. So we, we are not in a very mature phase. It is exactly when the copyright protections matter. You know, when, the, when a Hollywood, which is $80 billion industry, you know, you can't see a whole lot of thing happening in the data. So the infringement might happen for Hollywood movies, but it doesn't seem to affect the in incentives. As at least you can't see that very clearly in the data, as opposed to, uh, you know, India, where the industry in the nascent stages, and you can see some of those changes making a big difference. Um, so thank you. I cannot stop myself from shame, shamelessly plugging my book, so I'm going to do that. But uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, that was an insightful talk. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Mr. Kamath to add his insights uh, in a different industry context, healthcare. Maybe there we may not see some of the counterintuitive effects. Maybe we'll see some traditional effects. So I'm wondering. Yeah. So over to you. Yeah. Like somebody said yesterday, it's going from piracy to pills. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Right. <laughs> In fact, I, I've said slightly cruder analogy, Anand, while he puts up the presentation. You know, healthcare innovation, especially piracy. in the Indian context, is, is a very diverse and wide topic. Uh, it can be as, as simple as a glass of grape juice, you discuss it a little bit more, looks like a glass of wine. You discuss it a little bit more, becomes a glass of vinegar. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it at the glass of grape juice uh, uh, level today because in 15 minutes, uh, discussing healthcare globally, innovation in healthcare and with the Indian backdrop can be pretty uh, tricky. Uh, and as, as the PPD comes up, my thanks to the lady for uh, a very nice introduction. So I was impressed. If anybody else is impressed, please meet me in the tea break after the session. <laughs> if you folks have any offers uh, for a job. But on a serious note, uh, sincere thanks to ISB and all its partners for uh, uh, this platform on uh, innovation, intellectual property, and competition. The third word sometimes goes to the left of the first two words and sometimes on the right of the first two words. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak more about innovation rather than IPR and uh, 
com competition. Now that I already taken three minutes of a 15 minutes. So. Uh, I'll try and stay extremely focused uh, on this presentation and I want to make the following three points. Healthcare globally in India continues to be a great story commercially as well as in terms of making impact on human beings. So whether it's as an industry or in meeting unmet needs and bringing out the right outcomes, healthcare industry is here to stay and, and, and forever it will be a growth industry. Uh, India specifically with its faster than the global healthcare industry growth, a great process innovation and the, the great branded generic story uh, is, is already one of the largest contributors globally in, in terms of the healthcare industry. Uh, having said that, uh, we have a few asks or a few drivers. Uh, in terms of public health, you are already seeing a lot of government participation on initiatives like the Ayushman Bharat. Bharat. Uh, we also have the national IPR policy in context with the healthcare innovation. Uh, we want to still drive some focus on closing policy gaps. Um, and I also want to highlight the role of innovation in meeting unmet needs um, globally and in India that healthcare can drive. And to achieve the following, we still have some gaps in terms of focusing on R&D. We had a brief discussion yesterday. Uh, pricing, uh, IPR, uh, technology, somebody mentioned about technology transfer right at the start of this discussion. Uh, regulatory environment, especially in IP enforcement uh, and supply chain complexity. I represent MSD. As you see, the logo is Inventing for Life. We are a healthcare innovation company. Uh, we are a 126 year old company. And amongst all the data points put up in this slide, I'll, I'll draw your attention to just one data point. We spend in excess of $10 billion annually as far as primary research is concerned, which is roughly around 70,000 crores. Not only in the research of new chemical entities, we also do applied research. For example, in this very city, we have a research arrangement with another organization in bringing out heat stable vaccines. So we have a strong vaccines portfolio, but now for tropical countries, we are working on heat stable vaccines so that the entire supply chain complexity can be significantly reduced and the access can be improved. This is our legacy of contribution to human health uh, across therapeutic areas, right from diphtheria to uh, commercialization of penicillin. We were the first ones to come out with a statin uh, or an ARB, which is an antihypertensive, a DPP-4, which is an anti-diabetes product, oncology, anti-PD-1, a series of, and, and the whole range of vaccines. We are the largest contributor of uh, the vaccines innovation thanks to a scientist by the name Morris Hilleman. Uh, we have more than a dozen Nobel laureates associated with the uh, Merck, as we call in US and Canada, or the MSD research labs. And this is not only the legacy. This is the pipeline that I am legally allowed to share uh, to a public audience. And this is the kind of pipeline that we are working on. So not only did we significantly contribute in the past to healthcare innovation, we have a very strong plan and the mission to invent for life will not stop. And this is the kind of pipeline that I am allowed to share as you speak. And you can see this is across therapeutic uh, areas. In India, we are operating by three legal entities, 1,200 direct uh, headcount, more than 3,000 through our business partners, more than 80% local manufacturing. We have done some tech transfer for innovation sensitive products and started manufacturing in India for India as well as global supply. We also have a small presence in um, animal health. Uh, apart from the commercial footprint, there are a few projects that I wanted to share. Uh, because innovation is generally seen as a barrier to access, a barrier to competition, a representative of high price, which is not the case. Innovation, even in a country like India, can significantly drive access. We, for example, run a, product, a project called MSD for Mothers. It's to stop or reduce maternal mortality. India is a country with high maternal mortality. And I'll give a simple example. And that there are a lot of projects that happen. We are committed to saving more than 500,000 women uh, dying during childbirth. And I'll give a classical example. 
28%. So we firstly are almost one third of the global, slightly less than one third of the global uh, contribution in terms of maternal mortality. It's a shame. Almost 800 women uh, die every day, which is, which is nothing to be proud of. A very simple thing, you know, 28% of these women die because of postpartum hemorrhage. A simple injection of oxytocin within one hour of delivery can save a life of a mother. And the, and the logo and the motto for this MSD for mothers is very simple. No woman should die giving birth. It's a simple statement, but such a powerful statement. But this oxytocin is heat labile. So if you want this oxytocin to be there in a village to prevent a new mother uh, from not dying because of postpartum hemorrhage, you need an ice box. And somebody in the morning said a very beautiful statement that you can actually improve healthcare by building roads. It's as straight and simple as that. So if oxytocin is available. Now, one of the initiatives that MSD for Mothers is doing is to build heat stable oxytocin. So we don't have to worry about an ice box where there is not even a proper uh, road. Moving on from that, uh, we have had a lot of innovative projects in building capacity. In India, when we launched a diabetes products a couple of years back, we realized there were less than 1,000 endocrinologists for a population of 1.3 billion. We have more than 70 million people with diabetic, diabetes and another 70 million pre-diabetic. And it is less than 1,000 endocrinologists who will need to handle them, which means there is a huge responsibility of the general physicians. And we, along with the Public Health Foundation of India, um, started a capacity building program unbranded. So there was no brand, there was no molecule. We did that just to change and drive protocol-based therapy uh, management as far as diabetes is concerned. And we have trained more than 10,000 uh, doctors uh, so far, or general physicians, in how they should treat uh, diabetes. India leads in the concept of antimicrobial resistance because of the sheer misuse and abuse of antibiotics. Now, there are two things we can do. We can keep researching newer antibiotics, which we continue to do, but we also want to drive responsible antibiotic usage in this country. And we started something called antimicrobial stewardship, which is a very strongly protocol-based program at ensuring the right drug, right dosage, and right duration of the antibiotic is used. Uh, and this is significantly combating uh, right now more than 150 hospitals have adopted this and we can see a very strong reduction in resistance and improvement in outcomes with this particular program. Diabetes, as we all know, is a beyond the pill issue. We run a very strong patient counseling program. Again, no brand promotion there. A patient counseling program on how patients can do self-management of diabetes. We have counseled more than 100,000 patients here. We even do tailor-made diet charts. As, as you will know, a patient in Delhi and a patient in Kerala and a patient in Orissa might not necessarily have the same diet chart. So, you know, Google this here doesn't help. You, we have more than 100 counselors who do specialized diet charts. Going to global trends in the global pharmaceutical industry. We are talking of innovation. This graph fundamentally shows the per billion dollar returns in terms of new chemical entities that were being discovered. And you can see year by year the returns on the billions of dollars that organizations spent behind basic research was significantly falling. This significantly reduces the interest that organizations would have uh, in putting money behind research. Thankfully, thankfully, because of newer technology and focus on subjects like immunology, et cetera, the trend is reversing. And the new chemical entities that are being discovered per dollar billion of investment has seen a, seeing a uptick. This is, this is very heartening. And because of which, the global pharmaceutical sales year on year is significantly growing up and is expected to have a CAGR of around 5% plus now. Why is this important? Because in India, we are expecting this to be at around 15%, which is roughly three times the global pharma market. And we still aren't contributing significantly as far as innovation is concerned. So you can only imagine if India actually steps into the innovation arena, where can the Indian healthcare market reach? The other aspect is interconnectivity. 
there was a time when a molecule discovered in the US would take years to find its way into the so-called developing countries. Today, a clinical trial is released in the US. Five minutes later, my doctor calls me up and asks me queries on that clinical trial because he has already gone through it. And he expects the product to be in the country by the next Monday. That's the kind of interconnectivity that commerce and uh, innovation or information uh, uh, is taking place. Pricing pressure, another aspect impacting innovation will continue. So if I take India as one next, this is a study of the various countries and their respective pricing. And you will see that because of the high pricing that other countries today offer as, as payers uh, uh, to the pharma companies, there is tremendous pressure starting from the US as far as uh, the pricing uh, is concerned. The other aspect is therapeutic areas. And why it is very important to understand is that there are two kinds of broad areas. One with large patient groups or evolving patient groups. Second is, is, is what we call the orphan drugs or small patient groups. And I'll give you a classical example. We have a cervical cancer vaccine. The other day I was talking to a stakeholder and I don't want to get into uh, naming here. Uh, and when I was trying to promote the concept of cervical cancer vaccination, uh, because we lose around roughly 80,000 women every year die because of cervical cancer. Roughly 1,30,000 new women contract cervical cancer in this country and can be prevented by simple uh, vaccination. And when I was talking to that uh, stakeholder, he said, how many women die? I said, 80,000. By reflex, he told me, only 80,000. Now that's... That's one of the biggest barriers to innovation. And you must understand that if I go into even further therapeutic areas, like you know, multiple sclerosis, thalassemia, and so many other areas, we must please understand that somebody needs to still invest behind research in these, in these categories. We can't add numbers to human value. You know, somebody mentioned it very beautifully yesterday that our strength is our 1.3 billion population. In innovation, we must not make it our weakness. We must therefore focus on, on large categories as well as on niche categories because somebody has to invest and find out medicines to meet those unmet needs. Very essential. And that's why you see globally there's a huge change which is uh, 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 happening not only from a number of patients but also from niche categories. And this means if earlier there were conventional therapies, small molecules, non-recombinant vaccines, natural extract, today we are moving to gene therapies, Monoclonal antibodies we have launched from ourselves, uh, recombinant proteins, cell and tissue therapies, DNA and RNA therapeutics. Some of these I understand, some of these I don't understand, so I'm reading out from the slides. So. Uh, but we are getting into more advanced and niche therapeutic areas. But friends and colleagues, please understand, somebody still needs to focus on these because otherwise patients suffering from these conditions will die and they will not have a hope, which is not what as a healthcare organization uh, we can have as a thought process. Do let me know when is my time for the bell, sir. Uh, now, coming to India, because this was about healthcare innovation, coming to India, uh, a little bit about the environment. Um, we had the GST, the biggest tax reform, focus on infrastructure, uh, rural uh, um, uh, reforms. We saw even today, India's rank is improving. Uh, there is spice control, and that might remain one of the biggest challenge as far as the political and the regulatory environment for healthcare is concerned. Um, GDP to grow by 7.4% and we might have a dispute on a percentage here and there, but the larger story, growth story remains. Uh, fiscal consolidation, low inflation, uh, pharma market continues to grow. And again I repeat, this growth today is with a very, very, very small percentage of the global share with respect to innovation, especially with respect to R&D. So just imagine if this is the growth with such a low level of in innovation investment, imagine what can be India's place in the global healthcare um, uh, canvas if only we invest behind uh, innovation as well. Uh, a lot of good things, and I, I feel this event as well as a lot of these uh, discussions uh, are happening at the right time because rightly so, the government has taken up healthcare as a priority. 
Now, depending on which side of the table we are sitting, we might have a take on that subject. But I think as Indians and citizens, we all will agree that healthcare on the government's priority is good news. And we can see the Ayushman Bharat, we can see the IPR policy, we can see the Vision 2020, we can see the pharma policy, the healthcare policy, and its focus on non-communicable diseases. I think healthcare on the table is good news for all, all, all of us. And I think we all need to congratulate, compliment, and work with the government and all the stakeholders. Thanks. Uh, Just one slide, some critical policy gaps. This is the BCI survey 2017, and if you see India is somewhere in between, and I'm not comparing to mature markets, I'm comparing even to newcomer markets, which means whether it is clinical trials, market access and pricing, somebody mentioned unpredictability yesterday, or crucial IP gaps, we still have a long way to go. These are the three focus areas I want to end with. IP protection, patented product pricing, clinical trials. If we want innovation, if we want continued investment behind research, these three things are important. And even with respect to IP protection, I just want to say very simple things. We have a very strong IPR policy. We have a good IP regime, but it all boils down to enforcement. Like I mentioned in the smaller group yesterday, despite the government giving a patent, after four years, any one of us can go to any state government and get a marketing authorization without the state government having to check with the central government whether the product is under patent or not. I have personally suffered more than 25 infringements. This particular property where the event is being held is almost like a second home to me because half my time goes in courts fighting these infringements. A lot of time, effort, and perception can be corrected if only not the policy is changed, but the enforcement gap is rectified. It's a no-brainer. It's a very simple thing. Otherwise, globally, it becomes very difficult for us to explain to everyone why to continue to invest behind uh, uh, research when such, not policy, but enforcement gaps uh, exist. In conclusion, my first slide once again, pharma continues to be a great growth story. India is playing a very critical role in terms of policy and initiatives, but the government has a strong footprint, can get stronger. We need few fixes with respect to incentivizing R&D, transparency in pricing, enforcement of IPR, and, and things like supply chain complexity and uh, technical regulatory environment. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for the uh, insightful talk. Uh, I thought uh, you were going to touch upon healthcare slash pharma as a whole. Seems like you're talk certainly points out to the fact that there are, there's heterogeneity even inside pharma, and maybe uh, we should also be thinking about enforcement, and you know, hopefully the fourth speaker in this uh, panel is going to give us his views on uh, how well IPR is enforced uh, in India. But before that, uh, let me call on um, Professor Kathuria, uh, to talk on uh, an inquiry into the impact of India's app economy. So from uh, pills, we are back to the uh, app, I mean, ICT world, perhaps. Thanks, uh, Prof. And uh, at the outset, let me thank ISB and all the partners and Chandran especially for, for inviting me here uh, for this, uh, I, what I think is, is a terribly important topic. I'm going to approach this from the uh, perspective of competition, uh, which will rever reverberate in my talks uh, significantly, as well as from the point of view of, of regulation and licensing to, to an extent. Uh, there, are, there are lots of busy slides, but I'm only going to talk about the macro stuff. I leave the, uh, if you're interested, the slides will be here. You can have a look at that in your leisure, but I'll, I'll talk about broad kind of impacts of the app economy that uh, uh, India has seen and what we need to, to continue to kind of leverage or capture those huge beneficial impacts uh, that the app economy has brought to our country. Uh, and uh, uh, various examples, which I, I will keep giving during, uh, during the talk, but I do want to you know, set the background. Uh, you, you know all this, that data is the new oil and so on. And, uh, unfortunately, we don't know how to value this oil yet, but somebody will come out with a model of how this data can be valued. Uh, they, we know the value of uh, a barrel of oil, but we don't know what the 
value of data is, and there are lots of papers floating around in the literature which attempt to, to value data, and I think somebody at some point will come out with, with data valuation uh, and what value it brings, given that how data is being used uh, in our economies today, somebody would do that. But I think that's a research question that is crying out for, for attention. I don't think there'll be uh, too much accuracy in that, but if we get an order of magnitude or a sense of what the data economy is worth to us, then that cliche that everybody talks about data as the new oil will find some manifestation in a quantitative amount. But you know, let me you know, straight away go to India and, and set, as I said, the background uh, and why the app economy therefore came as a boon to us. Even the digital, even the telecom economy came as a, as a boon to India. I mean, it was a big boon. Those of you who grew up in India in the 80s and 90s would understand that the, the, the competition that was introduced uh, in, in the late 90s and the kind of impacts that it had was a big boon. And competition was, of course, technology was also at the heart uh, of the disruption that, that happened. But I think competition played a, a huge role. Uh, initially, uh, you know, India is divided into this bizarre uh, 19, 23 circles, uh, service areas for telecom, and uh, hopefully that with the new telecom policy might change. We might get one, uh, one license, uh, you know, uh, one service, one license, one nation uh, sort of approach, which, which may happen with, with the new telecom policy. But we have, you know, these 19 or 23, the four metros plus 19 service areas. Uh, and initially it was restricted to a duopoly, but then uh, more and more competition was introduced and there was a time when we had seven to eight operators uh, in a circle competing with one another to provide services with the result that the, the prices of, of, of telecom in India fell drastically and there were huge impacts on the macro economy. And it's now folklore to say that, you know, internet, broadband, mobile, all have uh, huge significant uh, impacts on the growth rate of, of uh, GDP. And there are some studies out there uh, which, uh, which talk about those uh, impacts using you know, the, the standard uh, regression simultaneous equation framework. But uh, what that did was that it made operators, you know, in some sense, the gatekeepers. They, they owned the consumer, they owned the subscriber, and they became the gatekeepers uh, of, of, of the you know, whatever reached the consumer. And therefore, the innovations that we saw, you know, in the app economy by the time the smartphone phones came in the early, uh, you know, part of this decade, uh, they, the, the, the innovation in the app economy due to competition or lack thereof uh, was significant in the sense there was no uh, innovation because the, the, the gatekeepers or, or the service providers did not allow the app to get access to the consumer because of the extremely sort of exploitative rate that they charged uh, the app maker. So uh, in, in order to get my app to the consumer, I had to go through the service provider and the re revenue sharing arrangement between the you know, innovator or the app maker and the service provider uh, was to the disadvantage of, of, the, of the app maker. And therefore, the 30-70 uh, sort of sharing arrangement did not provide the incentive for the app maker uh, to really, or for the apps to reach out to the consumer. All this changed with the advent of smartphones where uh, the consumer could be reached directly through the internet service provider and you didn't necessarily have to go uh, through the, the service provider. So the, so the gatekeeper function uh, of the service provider uh, was in a sense undermined and diluted by access directly to uh, the consumer through the internet and through the innovation of the smartphone. And that's when the app economy really exploded in India. And I think that was, that's very good. And competition, of course, has its benefits. And we've seen the benefits of competition in telecom. And now the benefits of competition in apps. Although, you know, Apple, uh, it, it's a closed system. Uh, Android is an open system. And therefore, you can compare the number of innovations and apps that you see in, in Apple. Also, you see significant, but you see a lot more in, in the open system uh, that Android allows you to. Uh, engage with. So the, the, the explosion in the app economy, the explosion the, before that in the, in the telecom economy, in the digital economy in India meant that uh, you had very large subscriber base, uh, a, a very large uh, sort of user base, but 
Unfortunately, it hasn't translated into uh, sort of data usage that you see in the rest of the world. And this is what this slide shows you. We, we, internet or the data has lagged behind voice in India, but it, it's hopefully going to catch up because we are on the cusp of a data re revolution. And you know, apps, in a sense, are leading that revolution. There's another sort of constraint that is imposed in India, uh, which I think is the excessive reliance on, on spectrum and the kind of little attention that has been paid to fiber. I think fiber would really be able to drive uh, data usage and the app economy much better, uh, while spectrum, of course, uh, is necessary, but it should not be the only way uh, through which data is provided. And I think that, that is a constraint, and uh, we can talk about that later if anybody is interested. But I think uh, the, the fiber in the ground is extremely important. And I think there's been a, a, a sort of paucity of that, both, of course, in, in rural areas, definitely, but also in, in certain urban areas. And that's why our app economy, even in the future, is going to be much less, in a sense, data intensive than our counterparts uh, on average globally. And this slide actually shows you that. So that's, that's really the first point I wish to make. And there, one can fill in the details. But that's the large, broad point that I wish to make, is that there's huge amount of innovation that happened due to competition and, of course, technology in the app space uh, and due to the openness of the system. And that is really driving. And to drive that further in India, uh, you know, investments in fiber, uh, apart from you know, harmonization of spectrum and making spectrum uh, more easily available and larger amounts of it available uh, for commercial use would be an added bonus for, for India. Uh, what is uh, the apps being used for, et cetera? You know, uh, I won't bore you with these details. This is just merely data and detail. But you know, it's mostly being used for social media and, and Facebook. And uh, I don't want to go into uh, this, especially at this time, given what's happened. Uh, around us in the last few days. Uh, in, the, in the future, India is going to be a very large consumer of apps, and uh, uh, globally as well, apps are going to grow very, very fast. But you know, to, to provide you an example of what I had said uh, in terms of what it has done for the Indian economy, and I had raised the point that you know, those of you who've lived in India in the 70s and, and 80s, uh, and I see some of you uh, uh, in the audience who, who did that, and you know, uh, uh, and one of the people I worked with and, uh, in 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 the 80s and in 90s is sitting in the audience and would certainly appreciate what I'm saying. Uh, is that you know, if you had to buy a railway ticket, for example, uh, and you wanted to travel anywhere from Delhi to Howrah or wherever, uh, Calcutta, Calcutta, because I, I studied in Calcutta until class 12. I had to stand in a queue for you know hours together. I mean, it was just maddening. And by the time your turn came, uh, when you got up to the first on the window, uh, it was anybody's guess whether you would actually get reservation or not. And, and, and there was this huge waste of time, inefficiency uh, that uh, existed in the economy. And come IRCTC, and IRCTC is just one example, and I love to use this example because it provides an ex evidence of how you can you know, improve speed, improve efficiency, and, and cut wastage and cut uh, you know, slack in the system. And today you can you know, book at, uh, you know, whenever you want, you can do a ticket and you don't have to, to stand. And that's the efficiency impact that not only telecom, but now especially app economy uh, has brought into the system. And there are several other examples that uh, you know, you've experienced, and uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, and I just wanted to you know, uh, bring out one, uh, which is Farmart. Uh, and I wanted to point out uh, to you, this is relating to the agriculture, uh, in the agriculture sector. And there have been several apps that have been uh, used in the agriculture sector by farmer soil testing, uh, you know, moisture content, all those exist, and I'm sure you've heard of uh, some of them. But one uh, which I wanted to uh, sort of bring to your attention, which is fairly nice and, uh, uh, and addresses some of our multiple uh, problems, which is, you know, you often hear in the winter about Delhi, uh, you know, experiencing smog around the city, and one of the things uh, that uh, uh, is, is a culprit is that you burn the residue on the farm uh, in and around Punjab and Haryana. 
And because farmers cannot afford uh, to buy a harvester to bury that into the ground. Now, one of the innovations that is happening in this space, uh, not only applied to, uh, to burying the residue into the ground, which can also uh, improve the, uh, the health of the soil, uh, is that uh, you know, farmers in India have very small land holdings. Over time, uh, due to our uh, structural transformation, the land holding size in India has diminished, and the average holding size is about a hectare or a couple of hectares, very, very small, which, with the result that small farmers cannot really afford uh, to buy these tractors or buy these you know, harvester machines uh, to be able to then use them uh, for not only burying the residue, but for other purposes, planting and harvesting as well. Now this app has come up which allows farmers to actually, uh, one, one person buys it, and then uh, through the app, sharing and the timing of the sharing uh, and the location of the sharing can be done. And Farmart is just one example of, of how this, this can be done. I'll take just a, a, a few more uh, minutes and I will conclude. Just bear with me. And as, as I said, there are many other uh, such examples. And what this has done is that uh, because India suffered and continues to suffer from a lack of adequate infrastructure, especially physical, Telecom came at a time as a boon, both to competition and technology, and now these apps, has come at a time where it's allowed us to overcome the constraints imposed by lack of other infrastructure by providing or driving these efficiencies. Not for a moment am I saying we should not build those roads, as Mr. Kamath was saying. Of course we should build those roads. Of course we should you know, provide access. But Meanwhile, while that is happening, you know, telecom and, and apps are providing us a little bit of sucker in terms of improving content and improving quality of access and so on and so forth. Of course, you know, apps also help address market failure uh, and those of you uh, who, who you know, sort of uh, work or, 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 or think about market failures, especially asymmetric information as a cause for market failure, would immediately recognize what apps and what digital economy can do to address those market failures that are, arise as a result of asymmetric information. And now you can rate your drivers on Uber. The drivers can re rate you on your taxi app and etc. reduce the asymmetry in information. So it's also helping you address uh, asymmetric information uh, and alleviating some sort of market failure. I, as I said, I, I'm leaving all this with Uber, Netflix. Uh, Rahul spoke about Netflix and the kind of uh, innovation that Netflix is having and the kind of competitive impact it's having on the economy. And uh, already in America, the number of cable TV subscribers has gone down, and I dare say that would happen in India as well. I want to end by saying that continuing, uh, of course, data breach challenges, etc., will remain. I, I, I want to end by saying that in India, we've had a sort of lot of discourse uh, around the app economy, around the app space uh, on net neutrality. And, and positions have been extremely divisive and, and polarized. And I'm going, not going to get into the details, but you know, the, the argument is that as long as the net is neutral, it will spawn innovation. And if the net doesn't remain neutral, then innovation will suffer. There's no empirical, this is a position, there's no empirical evidence uh, to, to support this statement, at least for India. It's an assertion that is made, as I said, on both sides of the, uh, the, the, the debate. You know, one side very pro, one side uh, the, the service providers of obviously saying that the huge investments in infrastructure that they've made, just to give you an example, although it's not related to net neutrality, and this is the example I would conclude with, service providers often argue, and there may be some justification to that, they invested huge amounts of money, here comes an app uh, which destroys the re revenue stream, which takes away you know, the ability to uh, you know, capture revenue from SMS or capture revenue from calling and, you know, well, innovation and disruption is a part and parcel uh, of business activity, so tough luck if that happens. But you have to, you know, for a moment, appreciate that these are licensed service providers, and there was a time when India was considering licensing apps as well. Now, apps come in all manner of shapes and sizes of all use. Consider, you know, if you were to license app, 
that would automatically reduce the extent of competition. Uh, but we don't have a, a, you know, a policy on net neutrality yet, an explicit policy, although TRAI has, ha has come out with occasional papers and said that no throttling, no uh, you know, prioritized content, etc. although you're able to discriminate uh, uh, on the basis of, uh, of the, of the uh, speeds. You can discriminate on speeds, but you can't discriminate on, on content. But I think, you know, uh, to conclude that India's app economy has been really innovative, especially after the sort of gatekeeping function was uh, diluted, the monopoly power was diluted. And although net neutrality we still have to define, apps continue to remain very, very innovative, especially in a service-constrained uh, economy like India. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for the valuable insights on the app economy. Um, now we will probably be talking about some legal and economic perspectives, maybe more uh, on the enforcement side of IPR. So looking forward uh, to uh, Mr. Robinson's insights on the topic. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been such a pleasure listening to the three co-panelists. It's just been absolutely outstanding, the kind of perspective that each one of them has brought about on their particular expertise, and especially you know, in terms of the economics and the big picture on how innovation, perhaps intellectual property, uh, fosters value and uh, promotes competition. So I'm kind of like a, from a different fold altogether. So, you know, as lawyers, we kind of like don't deal with data like the way economists and academics do. What we do is we are very particular. We handle cases. And over a period of time, we kind of like develop certain perspectives. And, to, and we see what's happening. Uh, I've been in the field of intellectual property now for over 20 years. <coughs> um, and so I have my, some of my own perspectives that I think might be useful to share from the forum point of view. So got distinguishing, you know, from a macroeconomic perspective, you know, I have anecdotal perspectives. But these anecdotal perspectives over a period of time kind of like seem to indicate certain kinds of trends. <clears throat> so the first thing actually that comes to my mind when we talk about intellectual property is what is intellectual property. I wouldn't have actually brought this up except that I heard something that I thought that I might want to comment upon this. Um, from a legal point of view, intellectual property is anything that you actually end up creating um, except when it's not protectable. And I will kind of like explain that. So there are two types of intellectual properties. One is statutory intellectual property and one is non-statutory intellectual property. So statutory intellectual property is what you call classical IP, which is patents, trademarks, copyright design, geographical indications, integrated circuits, and so on and so forth. And then you have non-classical IP, which is trade secrets, confidential information, and such like, which are just about as valuable. Now, whenever some creation is happening, now what is a creation? Creation is something, okay, so basically a creation is something new. Every time you do something new, there is probably a property value to it. And the reason why I say there's a property value to it is property probably almost always carries a value. Right? And that's why it's called property. <coughs> um, so every time you do something new, it has a property value to it. If it's not tangible, that is intellectual. We just kind of like break it up artificially into that kind of a construct. And if it's intellectual, we must find a way to protect it. Um, so this is how widely we cast uh, the realm of intellectual property. So it's not just what you call classical intellectual properties. The other thing that I've learned over a period of time, and this is something that, you know, quite honestly, when you are young, you kind of like start off like that, you kind of like think, that you know, um, 
intellectual property creation is really um, for the smart minds. You know, some smart folks come up with something new that adds value, and that's how it is. You know, not everyone is a Mozart. You know, that kind of a thing. Over a period of time, we've learned actually that's not true at all. So here's the thing. Intellectual property can be driven. Creativity can be driven. And that's very important from a corporate point of view. Because what you can do is actually have corporate disciplines. Okay? So that's not to say you don't require bright minds. Uh, that's only to say that you can actually force the pace of creation. You can actually initiate creation. Um, and creation and intellectual property have begun to inform upon each other. Okay, and which is it's a reverse justification that people say, actually, actually, it's a forward justification if, from my point of view. So they say, if you have good IP laws, you're going to have good creativity. Okay, um, from where I look at it, is, the way one looks at it is, creativity is the reason why you would want to have good intellectual property laws. Okay, um, creativity has a value to it. And if you look at it from the point of view of a creator, and I'll kind of like dovetail this in a little towards the latter part of my presentation. And if you really have a creator, okay, um, the first natural human value system that anyone would have is let him have the benefit of it. Really let him have the benefit of it. Okay, what intellectual property law does is exactly that. Let him have the benefit of it. And that's where we start from. Now, the thing is, if you kind of like look at it from the history of intellectual property, I've heard a lot about this. I've, I know very little, but what I do, I will share with you. Um, at different stages, different economies, different people require different kinds of intellectual property law so that the very law that's actually supposed to actually provide for you the push Okay, so that you can capitalize on your own creation does not end up working against you, okay, because it kind of like defeats the entire purpose. And that's how it's got to do with the mindset thing. Okay, and there was this very interesting statistic, and I'm sure, uh, you know, my colleagues could probably, you know, dwell upon that, that in 1947, when India gained independence, we, I've heard, as extreme statements that there was not one pharmaceutical manufacturing facility in India of, of any credibility. We had product patents. In 19, till 1970, we were following the 1911 Act that provided for product patents. We don't even, can't even manufacture a generic, we can't manufacture a Benadryl or whatever. Okay, um, it all came from overseas. Um, 1972, the 1970 Act actually came into effect in 1972. 1972 is when we did away with product patents. And which is the era, if you remember old Hindi movies, they were all about counterfeit medicines and people dying and things of the sort. That was probably the reason why, because there was nothing in the market at that point of time. It kind of like put a huge pressure uh, on access to medicines and, and led to all sorts of other collateral you know, malfeasances. 1972 onwards, till such time the statistic actually came out in support when we were signing up the TRIPS agreement and after that and we took the one plus plus, plus five year maximum advantage as a least developed country and things like that. The figures were floating between 24 and 33,000 uh, generic chemical, pharmaceutical grade chemical manufacturing facilities. That's the distance that we tied between somewhere after 1947 up till 2000s. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, so I wouldn't go ahead and say that, look, we haven't done much. I think that is kind of like remarkable. By the time we were already, we were in 2000s, we guys were talking about India being the supplier of genetics for the rest of the world. I think that's absolutely remarkable from where you come from. Um, the thing is, I think at sometimes we actually end up undervaluing ourselves. <clears throat> um, this was the first point. 
Okay. Um, the other point from a licensing point of view, because the word licensing appears, is it's again a state of a mind thing. In the 20 years that I've been practicing and over, um, how many license or licensee paradigms have I seen? Hundreds. How many of them where the India, where the Indian party has been a licensor? One. That has got nothing to do with who's the innovator and who's not. I have struggled with this simply for the reason, you know, you want to kind of like fix things in your mind as to how we look at ourselves. Um, and it's got to do with business models. It's got nothing to do with who is technology um, surplus and who's technology deficient. It's got to do with a mindset of where we place ourselves as of that point of time in a business model and did we ever revisit it. So if you kind of like look at the old traditional big industrial houses or anyone who's probably over a 3,000 uh, rupee, 3,000 crore rupee company, they are actually founded on um, demand and supply paradigm. They are founded on cost arbitrage. They are not founded on value generation. They're founded on capturing of the market and perhaps a little bit of value addition. But that's not the business model that the young Turks in the IP world or the tech world actually even look at. Um, so for them to actually move into a paradigm where you're saying that, look, this is no longer a competency, because quite honestly, as of this point in time, it does continue to be a competency. We continue to grow. And there's always a lot of demand over supply and there's, you know, and there's a market out there. But there's a casting of the mold thing that seems to have not been broken or recasting not having been taking place in a lot of these larger companies. And you see the difference coming in from the smaller ones. Um, the smaller ones are perhaps um, capital staffed. Um, they're hungry, they're creative, and they're finding gaps in the market, and they're becoming big over a period of time. But the paradigm has changed. The paradigm is that now that we are actually generating value, not on the basis simply of capital, but intellectual capital. And therefore, when you find, when you're looking into licensing, you know, over a period of time, the highest value licenses, licensing deals, etc., are ones done are between traditional sectors of upgradation. The one case, the actually two cases, and I'll talk about both. The one case was actually a, an amazing reverse where this very, very young, three year old Bangalore based startup is licensing and not selling. So this company, which is seriously big international multimedia um, entertainment company, is not buying them out. They are licensing a technology. Very, very different. So what they're saying is, they're taking a claim on the turf that we will remain here, we will continue to add value, we will not sell out, and we think that in future we'll have more things to make, and here you are, you can take some, and you can pay me rents. Massive, massive difference in the way people actually approach value generation. So um, that is my view. So basically, as I was talking to some <coughs> colleagues the other day, um, a license or a licensee paradigm is a state of mind. Intellectual property is basically a net fallout of a value proposition, a value generator, um, the value generator, it can come from anywhere. It can come in low tech, it come in, can come in high tech. I picked up this book very recently by Professor Kachru, who actually talks about grassroots innovations in the country. I, had, I didn't even know all this was happening. I just picked up, the, usually this is the kind of stuff I don't actually end up reading. But it was absolutely remarkable on how what you would typically consider to be not the value generators, 
not the educated, not the hyper educated and qualified people generating serious microeconomic level value for themselves and for the people around them. The same thing actually scales up as we talk about more and more capital and more and more people under the capital who can actually leverage that. <coughs> okay, so now coming to the legal side of it. Um, on the legal side, we've seen a lot of action and there's been a lot of perception that um, India does not enforce its IP laws properly. So there's a difference that I would like to make between what happens in the court and what happens outside the courts. So outside the courts, there are regulators, there are there's the police and this thing, and so yeah, we can leave that to a side for the time being because yeah, there are things that could be done better, and including in policy. Uh, as far as the courts is concerned, we are really fortunate because the courts actually look at it extremely neutrally. So when we actually had the first Novartis cases on EMRs, when the Mumbai High Court said that, look, we will not actually enforce this EMRs against the gen generics at this point of time because public interest says that we shouldn't. Okay, everyone said that this is a violation of intellectual property rights, it could well be. Um, and then the novartis Glivec case happened where 3D was challenged and it was upheld by the Supreme Court and everyone said this is the end of the world for patents. India actually signed up on a dead letter. It doesn't really intend to deliver on it. But consider what happened afterwards. Uh, you have your SEP cases. Um, if I was a standard contributor, what's happened in the last four years would not stop me from smiling. The courts have been very pro-IP. And that's to say that early on people used to make a distinction. Trademarks, yeah, we recognize Whirlpool as early as 995 and you know, and things like that, you know, as well-known trademarks and you know, we didn't do Prius very well because Prius should have been a you know, well-known trademark. It doesn't matter, the trend and trademarks has always been of the variety that look, India is good at enforcing trademarks. India is good at enforcing copyright. On patents, it begins to falter. That's not true at all. As in the Merck case against CIPLA, you have a finding of patent valid, patent non-infringed, goes up in, in, uh, uh, in appeal and you find patent valid and patent infringed and all this is happening. And this is the first big case that happened because the world really wanted to see what's gonna happen. Is every pharma case gonna go down like that? Is every pharma case gonna go down like a buyer compulsory license? There have been two compulsory license applications that since been rejected. Uh, so it's not free for everyone to take a grab. Um, and that is one perception I think that generally that seems to go out is that India is weak. Being a person who's there on the field, I don't think so at all. For the reason that we find our judges to be very, very neutral. They really don't care where you're coming from. They talk about equities, they will talk about equities very, very sensibly. Not towards leaning towards one side over the other or anything. They would want to tend to attend to the law. And that's the most important thing. <clears throat> Same thing's borne out on piracy front. Don't have enough time, but if anyone wants to talk, to, talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it after this. Uh, but similarly, the same thing, the manner in which the ISPs were actually squeezed and the manner in which you know, uh, the courts realized that there's been an abuse on the part of the IP owners to squeeze the ISPs just so that it's convenient uh, to not go after the other infringers, um, etc., has not been rectified. So it might take time because these are very, very, very complex, you know, propositions of law, including that of fact. Um, and the manner in which they plead it makes a huge difference in an outcome. Um, but the correction happens. And this is something that I find absolutely remarkable about our courts is correction happens. And generally, they're all in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the background on uh, what happens in the courts and for the distinction that you know, what we perceive as uh, you know, maybe uh, um, enforcement issues has to be, you know, that one has to distinguish between what happens inside the courts versus outside. Thank you very much for those perspectives. Um, I just wanted to provide a quick summary. I just wanted to check how much time I have. Okay, so I'll quickly... 
Okay, so I will probably turn it to the audience for questions. Uh, with one line summary, for me, this session was about two things. One about enforcement uh, and what we mean by enforcement and what are the problems surrounding enforcement. And at some level, maybe how the advent of uh, technology itself influences long run incentives to innovation. So with that summary, I'll turn it over to the audience for questions. Uh, let me go to the gentleman right at the back. Yeah, if you have a mic. Yeah, there, there you go. Santanu Mukherjee. I'm a lawyer and I, I work in the area of intellectual property competition trade laws. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's not very easy to get uh, the hem of people, hem of affairs like Mr. Kamath. And my question is to Mr. Kamath. It's, it's, I'm just curious. Uh, <clears throat> my observation is that as you said, the government has done quite a lot on public health. I do agree with you quite a, quite a bit. On the policy side, I see that Merck has also done quite a lot and there has been significant changes. On that background, my question is, in 2050, if I'm not wrong, Merck joined the medicine pool, the patent medicine pool. So, especially if I'm not wrong again, on uh, HIV drug for pediatrics. Now the question is, do we still see Merck with the program or it has closed? The second question is, did you, you in the sense Merck, expand from uh, pediatric HIV to the other areas? And how do you see the policy dynamics changing? with your move in 2015? Do you see it happening more in 2018 and forward? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, thanks, uh, Shantanu. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll split the answer in three ways. So as far as HIV is concerned, both in terms of innovation as well as partnership, uh, India and globally, we, we continue to remain committed to access. In fact, when uh, uh, the friend from uh, the, the legal uh, concern was talking about Merck and supply. I want to actually seek a clarification. Is it the other Merck or MSD? I uh, think it's the other Merck. Other Merck, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we have a partnership with Sipla even in India as far as HIV is concerned. And to the credit of Sipla, they have never infringed upon our uh, patent. It was Glenmark. Just, just, just. Uh, so we have a continued relationship with Sipla here uh, as well as globally in the field of HIV for the current therapy areas, for, for the current research product as well as for the future research products. So we are, we are continued, we have a continued commitment to access uh, in the field of uh, uh, HIV. So. Um, time for one, one more question, yeah? yeah maybe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is for Professor Telan. A very uh, insightful presentation about polio piracy PCRs, but it sounded like from your research that the correction happened because of technology, the digitization of cinemas. The question is, was there something on anti-piracy laws or policies or federal enforcement that also contributed to that correction, or was it entirely a technology? I think it's a good point. Just because correction happened doesn't mean that piracy still doesn't erode the value. We just don't know. All it means is, in fact, a lot of our research actually has shown that only anti-piracy efforts don't really work. The firm also has to respond to the market demand. So if you don't make your content available on the legal channels, and if you don't make your content available at the fair prices, no matter how many anti-piracy efforts you take, no matter how supportive courts are, consumers will find ways to essentially infringe on your content. So, we know that what typically works is a combination of market response as well as some sort of protection uh, from the IPR regime. So just because correction happens, probably you know, there is still, in fact, I'll give you a good example. World over, home entertainment market is the largest money spinner. You know, Hollywood makes 70% of its actual profits from the home entertainment, which is the second order, licensing, DVDs, and in India, 
virtually there is no home entertainment market. Very little, 4 or 5% of the revenues come. And one big reason is that the piracy essentially makes it unviable. We are unwilling to buy DVDs, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So, so the producers figure out a way to, to make money as quickly as possible. I won't bore you with detail. India is one of the few countries where the movies come on the television within three months of, of theatrical release. And one big reason is there is no middle value chain left. Um, so does market respond to it? Of course it does. Uh, but could the IP regime make it more profitable for firms to invest? I think that is true as well. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe you, most, many of you can have uh, offline conversations with the panelists. I'd like to thank the panelists for an insightful session. Um, I think... Uh, token of appreciation. All right. Thank token you so much, Professor Rahul Tela. All right. Thank you very much. A photo of. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very good, insightful talk. All right. Mr. Rajat Kataria. Mr. Rajat, thank you very much. You have a lot of fun hearing about the app economy. Yeah. Mr. Dave Robinson. Dave Robinson for taking us inside the courts of India. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite Professor Rahul Telang to give a token of appreciation to Professor Anand huh. for doing a wonderful job moderating the panel. All right, thank you very much. Um, now we'll take a quick break. Maybe there's a group picture also that they would like to group take. Group picture the as well, right? So 